Hey, I'm Todd Sepulveda. I am the pastor of Focus Church, and I want to welcome you. If you are not a member of our church, maybe you saw this online somewhere on somebody's feed and you came to join us, and uh, we're just grateful for you to be here and to worship with us and worship the Lord and, what, and to see what he has for us, for you this morning. I think that's so important. Hey, you know, when although we're doing this online, and, and this is, you know, not ideal as far as a lot of people perceive church. You know, we have a mindset of what church should be like. There's still ways that we can be ready for church. It's not just simply turning on a, a live stream like normally uh, we might see someone, you know, live streaming online or uh, we might see a video or, or something along those lines. You know, this is this is church. So we still do the same types of things where we get our minds and our hearts ready to receive what the Lord has to say. You know, we get our Bibles and we get our notepads and, and uh, I mean, we have our coffee and we're, we're ready to go and we minimize distractions. It's a little bit easier to get distracted when you're at home or wherever you're watching this. But the same kind of thing happens in church as well. You know, when I'm on the stage and I'm preaching, I look out at the crowd and, and I see, uh, or at the congregation, and I see people on their phones and, and I see people, you know, looking around, people sleeping, all those different types of things. So, you know, it's the same type of ideas. We minimize distractions so that we are prepared to worship and to seek the Lord. There's no limit. I'm so convinced of this. There is no limit to God's power. There is no distance. You know, you don't have to be five feet with it, you know, close to the preacher. You don't have to be within a hundred yards of a church to feel the presence of God. I always remember that Roman soldier who came to came to Jesus and he was concerned about his servant who was uh, who was uh, dying and Jesus was going with him. And he said, well, I don't need you to go. I just need you to say the word and it'll be done. And there's this aspect and this understanding of no matter where we are, that God can reach us all together as a church, as the body of Christ. And we are worshiping together, not just one-on-one -on -one here and, 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 and through this, but we are worshiping with our brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world. And, and they, they might be at a different, a different time zone, but they're worshiping God. And that's so awesome. And that's so great to be able to have that understanding and that mindset that we are worshiping with our brothers and sisters. And one day we will be face to face up in heaven. Can't wait for that day. Hey, you will notice that you are seeing closed captioning right now. And I, I got to tell you a story. So you know that when we were face to face before all the COVID and all the stuff happened, that I was talking about this desire to be able to reach people who uh, needed, who, who couldn't hear who needed maybe someone signing. And at that time, that's what we were looking for. We were looking for someone to sign so that they could, you know, we could get the message out there as well. And so we were kind of processing through all of that. And then just recently at work, um, we have this big initiative that I'm responsible for. And uh, because it's so new, I've been sending out uh, videos and I really got called on the carpet by our deaf community. And, and so they, they were like, hey, Todd, we, we love your video, but there's a lot of our teachers and there's a lot of aides out here who, and students who are deaf, who can't, who, who can't hear what you're saying. So we need a little bit of time. We'll work with you. We'll translate it out for you if you, or sign it out for you if you give us some time. And I've, I'm just turning out stuff, you know, just to get it out there so fast. And, um, one of our, our team members created a GIF and basically that's a video, just, you know, just a quick video and she had words in it, text. And I'm like, well, that's great. That's exactly what I'm saying in my video, but this has text in it. So I sent it to them. I sent it to the, to the coordinator and I said, Hey, does this work? And she said, yes, this is great. This is beautiful. And so we also did it in Spanish because, you know, we have a, a big Spanish community and they, you know, in order to be able to, to turn it over very quickly, we could do the Spanish words, translations in there and get it out there. But in doing that, I had that idea of, man, we could do closed captioning here. And I was looking for a solution and I've tried different things. I've tried like Microsoft has the immersive reader and Google has their, uh, their, you know, th their uh, speech as well. 
But they weren't always as accurate. And Belinda always made fun of me because I would say different things and they would come across crazy. And so I've been looking for a better solution and I found one. I tried it out Thursday. Now, listen, it's not all perfect, but this is live, live closed captioning. And it is a lot better than the other uh, closed captionings that I have tried before. So think about what we can do here and what we can, the people that we can reach. There are people out there that can't go to church right now because they, you know, they're not going to church because of the COVID thing. And maybe their churches aren't having face-to-face uh, -face churches. But then on top of that, there is not a way that they can understand what is being said. And because this is live and because this is so much better in, in the closed captioning and, and picking up what I'm saying, especially if I don't speak very fast, what a blessing it, it would be out there to those in the deaf community who cannot uh, understand, who want to worship, who want to praise God, but that cannot understand what is being said because it just the, they can't read lips so far away and there's not somebody there signing. So what a great, great opportunity. And uh, I just pray that you would be praying and, and that the Lord will use this in a, in a powerful way out there to be able to reach people on Thursdays and on Sunday mornings when we are doing our online services. Listen, I also want to let you know that um, I'm working on a Tuesday night Bible study, an old school Bible study. And what I mean by that is it'll be old school where we have some paper <laughs> and we have a Bible and we have study, a study guide, and we're going through that. And this will be online as well. And I'm working on it. it it'll be uh, run a little bit more through email as far as getting the information out there. But I'm working on that. I'm going to have that prepared. We'll be doing it through Zoom. And I'm really excited about it. So that'll be Tuesday nights. And I, I'm going to settle on a time. But I'll get that information out to you. And I'm really excited about how God can use this as well. Because I really believe that this will open up even more opportunities to minister. That is the key right there. Is that we have opportunities for uh, to, to spread the gospel and to learn and to grow in the Lord. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to be where I was. I don't want to be next week or a month from now or a year from now in the same place that I'm at right now. And I think I'm in a good place right now with the Lord, praying and seeking his face and, and, and desiring what he desires but I want to grow and I hope you want to grow as well in the Lord. So be looking for that. I'm going to have more information as we go forward with that. If you'd like to give, uh, we have ways to give online. And so you can go over to focuschurch.com and there is uh, a giving up on the top. There's a giving link. You can give through PayPal. You can use Kindred, which is a, uh, a texting app, which is really great uh, opportunity to, to just, you set it up one time and then you're able to give that way. And then you can also just mail in a check. But if you're going to mail it in, mail it into our P.O. box um, because the, the location at Faith West Academy, there's not anybody there. There's not anybody looking at that mailbox there. So if you will send it into our P.O. box, then uh, we can make sure that we get that. All right. And again, don't forget our Thursday night devotionals that we are doing uh, every every Thursday night. We do it live on Facebook. I'm also starting to move those over to YouTube as well and just trying to get the message out as more as, as most as, as as much as I can. Uh, as right now, what, one of the things that I'm doing, uh, I'm doing this uh, for the very first time is I'm streaming live on Instagram as well. And so uh, all the people that are there on Instagram, thank you for joining me there. And uh, we're just going to get the message out as much as possible. All right. So let's go ahead and move into our message for this morning. The message is entitled The Love of God. And so as we go into that message and as we get ready, I pray that your hearts are ready and you're ready to receive that The spirit is, is ready to, to listen in and to, to grab it, everything that God has for you this morning. So let's pray and seek the Lord and we will just move, move forward. All right. Father, we thank you so much. We give you all the praise and glory again for this awesome opportunity, Lord, to be a witness for you, not only to hear the message, but to be a witness for you right now, live online, and that people could hear this message 
all around the world, that your word would go forward. Lord, we thank you for the awesome opportunity to be able to provide the, uh, the closed captioning. And we pray that people would be blessed because of that. And we ask you, Lord, that you would help us right now, that our eyes would be ready to see, our ears would be ready to hear, that our minds would be ready to understand, our spirits are here ready to take in everything that you would have for us this morning. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So I say that about Instagram, and then it kind of goes, it's go, it's paused, and now it's reconnecting. But I believe we're still good here, right? I think we're good. Amen. All right, so here we go. Let's keep moving forward. The title of today's message is The Love of God. Now, listen, I don't have to tell you right now that the world that we are living in is absolutely nuts. It's absolutely crazy right now. And... You know, there's so many people out there that are frustrated and so many people out there that are scared. So many people that are out there looking for answers. There's people that are lashing out and, and, and because they're so frustrated and so upset. And you see that all, all over. There's people that are lashing out violently and then there's people that are lashing out verbally. And the answers that the world is coming up with are all wrong and sorely insufficient. Listen, the answer to a confused, hurt, and dying world is Jesus. It always has been. It is not going to be found in more financial stimulation. It is not going to be, or economic stimulation. It's not going to be found in political reform. It's not going to be found in, in processes and procedures that help things just move better. It's always going to be Jesus. The answer to the world is going to be Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 29, Come to me, all who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Don't you think that's what the world needs right now? Is rest for their souls? If we could just help people to understand that and people would open up their hearts to the fact that Jesus truly is the answer. That is still the answer. When Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weak and heavy laden. When he said that, when he, when he was here on the earth 2,000 years ago, that is still the same answer for today. It's still the same answer. And it will be until Jesus comes back. That will be the answer. And the, the day that we fly, we go home, that's going to be the answer. It's always going to be Jesus. But what is the mechanism? For the world to know and to understand that Jesus is the answer. What is the mechanism? How does that happen? How does that go forth? That's what I want to talk a little bit about today. And to start it all off, I want to start out with a scripture that is so familiar to every single one of us. In fact, if we were watching video right now, or uh, football, I'm sorry, if we were watching uh, football right now or sports games, we would see it. John 3.16. Listen, listen to this very carefully because there's this tendency to say, okay, that's a scripture that I know all, I've heard it so many times before. John 3.16. Yeah, uh, that's, that's right. So let, let's, but I want you to listen to it very carefully. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. See, God's love is the key. God loved so much that he sent his only begotten son. He didn't send an angel. He didn't send, uh, he, he didn't send another uh, a book of the Bible. He didn't send a prophet. He sent his only son. He said, this is so important. My love is so important. It's so important for people to understand this, that I'm going to send the most precious thing to me, my son, to this earth. So God showed how much that he loved us. Listen, again, like I said, he didn't give us a formula. He didn't give us an idea. 
He didn't give us an ideology or a form of government. He gave us his only son. It is the ultimate gift for us. His love is tied to his son. It is the most important thing. It is the most important thing that Christians should be talking about right now and always until that day when we fly, when we meet him in the air. It's the most important thing that we need to be talking about and that we need to be showing out there. And if we are not doing that, if the love of God is not found inside of us, then we're missing it greatly. We are missing it so badly. So let's talk about this and let's talk about how the love of God begins to work through us. Because it's not as simple as let me go give everybody a hug. Let me go give everybody, you know, a milkshake and let me put a smile on their face. That's not what the love of God is. Let's talk about the love of God. The love of God is covenant love, right? And a covenant means an agreement. It means an agreement between two people. But here's the thing. God doesn't have to, uh, it's between it's us and, and, and God, but you know, it's all on God's uh, plan. It's all on God's doing. We are the recipients of it. We can receive it. And God is the giver of this. And here's the thing. God's covenant with us. The way that he does, you know, there's so many people nowadays that break their uh, agreements. You know, they, back in the day, you could have a handshake and that was good enough. Now a handshake is not good enough. Now you have to draw up all these papers and have lawyers and all this kind of stuff. And that is that that doesn't even work a lot of the times because then people go to court and they get out of it. You know, they, they, they get out of uh, their commitments and the things that they agreed on. But that's not the case with God. See, God's covenant does not falter. He doesn't change. His covenants are yes and, and, and always. So we in Deuteronomy chapter 7, I want to go there really quickly here. Deuteronomy chapter 7. And so I'm going to go here in my browser. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 to 9 says, the Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now therefore, that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousandth generation with those who love him and keep his commandments. Man, what a great thing there. A great understanding that God did not choose us because of something that we did. It's in, and it's not something that we could earn his love. He just, he just gave it to us, right? And it's not conditional in the fact that, and you know, that, oh man, if, if I don't love him today, then God is going to take his love away from me. No, God's love is always there. Now, it's conditional if we choose not to accept his love, but his love is always there. His love is always going forth. His love is always available to anyone who desires to seek him. God never gave up on the Jews, even when they disobeyed him, because he loved them. He chose them and anybody else that was connected with, with them. Now, here's the thing. He did discipline them. And that's key because sometimes we're like, well, you know, like a child might say, you don't love me when they get a, when they get disciplined, they go into timeout or they get a spanking or they get something like that. You know, you might have a kid that says, well, you don't love me because you're being mean to me. And people would say, you know, might say the same thing to God. You're being mean to me, God. And God's love is not like that at all. He disciplines us only when, and the biblical pattern is so very clear in, in, in the Bible, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the biblical pattern is so clear when we are walking in his commandments, when we are walking the way that we're supposed to be walking, then God's blessings are there and surround us. 
That doesn't mean that there's not hardships. There's doesn't that doesn't mean that there's not tribulation. That doesn't mean that there's things that that we have to deal with. But the love of God is there and pushes us through and gets us through. But when we choose to turn our backs like the Jews did, then God says, you know what? I, I know the very best place for you is right in the center of my love, right in the center of my will. So I'm going to discipline you to get your attention. And for their disobedience, they faced huge trials. They faced huge tribulations. And they eventually even went into exile. In fact, the whole end of the whole Testament and all the prophets are about, guys, y'all aren't living for the Lord. Y'all aren't, y'all aren't living according to his commands. So turn back or God is going to discipline you to get your attention. But he never stopped loving them. His love continued even in the exile. His ex, the exile was, you're only going to be there for a little, a little bit, for, uh, for a time. And then we're going to, you're going to come back. I'm going to bring you back home. So his love continues for the Jews and even to this day. But because of our, be, because we are grafted into the, the tree of, uh, lo, you know, God's love, we get to have that same uh, covenant that Abraham had. Because Abraham, God said he was going to bless everybody, uh, all the nations of the earth. And it wasn't just a physical a physical lineage. It was a faith lineage. Those who have the faith of Abraham are going to be blessed like Abraham was blessed. And we get to be grafted into the tree because we have faith like Abraham had. Man, what a true blessing that is. Now here, let's move on with this because God's love is accessible and available through Jesus on this side of the resurrection. On this side of the cross and the resurrection where, where we live right now, God's love is accessible to us through Jesus. See, when Jesus comes on the scene, he gets on to the Jews because after all that they've gone through, all, after all of their history, after all of the prophets and the exile and the wars and the fighting and the ways that they had they, that God showed up for them, after all of that and after all that they, they went through, after all the understanding of the scripture, they still didn't understand the love of God. And Jesus said that the Jews didn't have the love of God or the love of the Father in them because they rejected him. They were looking, they had their minds set on a certain way and on a certain Messiah and the way things were going to look. And they missed Jesus and they rejected Jesus. And because they rejected Jesus, they rejected the love of the Father. Now, James, James, John chapter 5, verse 5. I'm sorry, James chapter 5, trying to do too many things here. Verses 40 to 43 says this. And you are unwilling to come to me. This is Jesus speaking. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. You see, the key to understanding the love of God is that we receive Jesus and we receive him. And that's so important for us. It's so important for us to receive him and that he is shining and living through us because other people that are out there looking for answers and looking for understanding need to see Jesus on the inside of us. If we're never showing Jesus the love of God, if we're never showing uh, what that is, what that looks like, if we're never talking about it, how are people going to know the love of God? We're going, they're going to miss it because it needs to come through Jesus. Jesus needs to be on, on our, in our words. Jesus needs to be in our actions. Jesus needs to be in everything we do because that's how the love of God is accept, accessible to other people. And here's another thing. The love of God has been poured out on us 
through the Holy Spirit. Now, listen, I talk about the Holy Spirit a whole lot. The Holy Spirit is so important and we don't grasp it. I think, you know, we live in extremes, right? And we can just take our current situation right now. You have ext- extremes on this side and extremes on this side. And, and everyone seems like even those that are in the middle are like put, being pushed to one extreme. The same thing has happened with the Holy Spirit. Is you have people over here that says, well, the Holy Spirit was for the days of the New Testament church. And then you have people that are over here that says, no, the Holy Spirit is here. And so you go over here to where it's so dry, the Holy Spirit never has an opportunity to move. Then you go over here where it's so elaborate and it seems like it's so fake. And sometimes I'm going to tell you, it is fake. It is brought on. It is hyped up because they feel like the Holy Spirit needs to show up. And, and we need to really be truly balanced because the Holy Spirit is on the inside of us. You know, when you receive Jesus Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. I talk about this all the time. We're going to get to heaven and we're going to realize, man, we missed it so badly because we had the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives inside of you. And we didn't really understand it and tap in to what God's Spirit on the inside of us truly, truly means. But here it is. The Holy Spirit is poured out on us. And when the Holy Spirit is poured out on us, the love of God is poured on in a great, great way. Let me say something to you here. and We're going to read the scripture in just a minute. Without the Holy Spirit, you can't have the love of God. Without the Holy Spirit inside of you, manifesting inside of you, leading you, guiding you, being the big part of your life, you can't have the love of God like you're supposed to. Look, let's look at Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. Let me go there in in my browser. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulations bring about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint. Listen, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given, who was given to us. Listen, man, this is good. This is good. If if you think this is good, give me an amen in the comments, man. Come on. This is good. I hope you're saying rock on Todd, preach, preach it. Amen. Right? Because here's the thing. We're going to have tribulations. I mean, that's the thing. These money preachers that are on television that talk about, you know, there's like, hey, you, the reason that you are not blessed right now is because you're not giving enough or you have sin in your life. That's not what Paul was saying. I think Paul knows a little bit about something here about the Holy Spirit. So in, here in Romans chapter five, Paul is talking about we're going to have tribulations, but hey, we're going to persevere. And, and that leads to proven character. And that's hope. And hope doesn't d- disappoint. And the reason that all those things don't, don't wreck us is because we have the Holy Spirit poured out on us. The love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Let me tell you something, without the Holy Spirit active in your life, without the Holy Spirit moving greatly in your life, the love of God is not going to shine through. The love of God is not going to be there and show up like it should. And it should. That word poured out, I want you to know that it's a metaphor for given largely. It's like, you know, when you have... um, a candy bar and you're sharing it with people you know like the Hershey's candy bars and like you're breaking it apart and you're like here's one for you and here's one for you and here's one for you and and it's like you know you, you you're trying to make this thing you know last and, and 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 go go as far as possible 
That's not God. That is not the Holy Spirit. The way that the, this word is, is uh, the metaphor is it, it's like it's poured out largely, like overflowing, like there is an abundance and there's more than enough. So the Holy Spirit poured out, the love of God is poured out on us through the Holy Spirit, poured out largely, given to us in a great abundance. Without the Holy Spirit active in our lives, we're missing it. We can't show the love of God. We can't be effective with the love of God. Our love is going to be dry. Our love is going to be focused on something else. Our love is going to be focused on something worldly if it's not focused on the love of God because of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me say something else here. Nothing, oh, this is good. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Listen, there is no higher power, right? So if I wanted to fight, I don't know, let's say my taxes. I don't like how much the the, the county authority, the tax appraisal uh, uh, system uh, taxed my house, right? It's like too much. So I want to go fight it. And I go fight it and I say... No, this isn't, this is too much. There's no way, you know, all the other homes in, in my area are, are not this much. And they say, sorry, sucker, you're going to pay this amount of money, right? Because we are a higher authority than you. And then maybe we could take it up to another authority and we take it up to another authority and they're going to defer and, and they're going to say, well, no, the tax authority, they're really the, the authority. And you get to a point where like, there's nothing else you can do. So you either pay it or you're gonna get fined and you're gonna get in trouble and they'll put a lien on your house and they do all this kind of stuff, right? But what if that authority was Jesus? And he said, Jesus, hey, I've got this problem here. And he looks at it and he says, yeah, don't worry, I can take care of it. You see, that means so much more. And so when we come to this part in our life where we try to manage this love of God and the love of God is, is there. And where people would be saying, yeah, you don't have the love of God or no, the love of God is not active in your life or, or you can't have the love of God. Then that, those people mean nothing. They don't say what they're saying means nothing. They can say everything they want, but it means absolutely nothing because the final authority is God. So look at Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39. Let me go there here in my browser. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Right? If God is for us, this is Paul writing again. It's like if God is for us, if God is the one that is in charge... Who, who can be against us? He is that authority. He is the final authority. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. Going back to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. If God would not spare his own son for us to deliver us out, come up, what else is there to understand? How will he not also with him freely give us all things. See, it's so good that God is in control and not me, right? It's so good that God is in control and some other, not some other authority. Verse 33, who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. So you think about standing in front of God and standing in front of the throne. And someone comes up, and let's just, it's even Satan or somebody else comes up and says, man, Todd is not worthy. Todd is, is, is no good. Todd is a failure. Todd can't do it. But Paul is saying here, God is the one who justifies. God, God is like, uh, sorry, I don't have to listen to you. I'm the one who justifies. I'm the final authority. But then it just doesn't stop there. Look, verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised, who is the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. So we're standing in front of the throne room and we have God, God who justifies. But we also have Jesus there who's interceding for us. 
Jesus is like, oh, no, no, he's, he's, he's good. He's mine. He's, he's redeemed. He is, he is saved. He has me in his heart. The love of the Father is on the inside of him. So we have God who justifies. We have Jesus on the right side. I mean, come on, what else is there? Verse 35, so who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, listen, listen, will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither, oh, this is so good, for neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, this is a very important scripture. You need to underline it. You need to highlight it. You need the exclamation point. Because this tells us that there's nothing. Even upon death, you are not separated from God, from the love of God. That means when you, even if you're in the midst of trials and tribulations, if you're in the midst of the worst life that you ever thought, you're like, you know, this isn't my best life ever. This is my worst life ever. But according to God, no, you are not separated from his love. And even if you are to die, which so many people here on this earth understand that death is it. That's it. You close your eyes. You breathe your last. You are no more. That is not the case for those who love God. That is not the case for those that have the love of God on the inside of them. Because death cannot separate you from God. So that means that there is something greater than your life. Greater than your flesh. Greater than your heartbeat and your mind brain waves. That is that you're, you are spirit and you belong to Jesus. And that even death, if you were to die and your body was to fail, that you are still walking in the love of God. You are still there in the love of God. Nothing separates you from the love of God. And we need to understand that. Because sometimes you might feel like you are unworthy. There are some of you that are watching right now that you feel like you are unworthy. You feel like the love of God cannot penetrate your, your hard heart. You feel like the love of God is not, uh, is not enough for you. And that is so wrong. God sent his only son to die on the cross so that you could have and experience the love of God. And there is nothing that can separate you unless you choose to turn your face away from the things of God. That is the only way that you are separated if you choose not to accept it. It is the gift that has been given to you to accept the love of God through Jesus Christ. And nothing will separate you from the love of God. Let's keep moving forward because I still have more for you. Man, this is good. And this isn't me. This is God just moving here and just sharing this. That was a real important spiritual understanding. The love of God is for you and nothing can separate you. Listen, those that love God, here is this key. Those that love God will keep his commandments. That is how we are identified. And that is how we identify others by keeping his commandments. See, John, 1 John chapter 2, verses 4 to 6, says this. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. That is pretty strong language right there for John, right? Like, John, man, you must have been fired up right there. The one who says that I have come to know Jesus. I have walked that aisle. I have given my life to Jesus. I said the sinner's prayer. I got the little Bible track and, and all that kind of stuff. But you do not keep his commandments? 
You are a liar, and the truth is not in you. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him. Listen, if you are a believer, and you are a Christian, and you say that you abide in him, then you ought to walk in the same manner that he walked. Now, you can't be perfect like Jesus was perfect, but we are called to walk. You ought to walk in the same manner that he also walked. Man, that is so powerful. Walk in the same manner that he also walked. That is how we identify ourselves. That is how we know that we are his and we know others that are his. But listen, that means that we know the Bible. That means that we know his word. That means that we know his commands. And when we don't get into his word and we don't know his commands, and then how can we walk the way that we're supposed to walk? We need to be in the Bible daily. And that's why that's one of the most important spiritual disciplines. It's always the same. Prayer, reading the Bible, being led by the Holy Spirit, and having communion with the saints. That is so important. So the love of God, those that love God, will keep His commandments. Now, believers, believers are also called to keep themselves in the love of God. Not only in, not only in reading the Bible, but being proactive in staying in the love of God. You know, Jude, in the book of Jude, which is only one chapter, Jude talks about, about false teachers and the challenges of the day. And he reminds believers that they are called to keep themselves in the love of God. So let's go there really quickly. Jude uh, chapter 1, and there's only one chapter, verses 20 to 23. But you, beloved, building yourself up, right? Building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in the love of God. Not keep yourself in church, not keep yourself in, 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 in giving offerings, not get, keep yourself in, keep yourself in the love of God. That is the answer, right? In the love of God through Jesus Christ. And when you do that, everything else begins to fall in place. All the other things fall in place. Praying in the Holy Spirit, verse 21, keep yourself in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Man, I don't know about you, but lately I've been saying, Jesus, I'm ready. Let's fly. Until then, I'm going to occupy. Until then, God, I want everything that you want me to do. I want to do that. I want to go even further. I want to do I want to do everything that I can for the kingdom of God while I live here. But don't don't miss the fact that I'm ready to fly. I'm ready to go, right? And this world is so crazy, and I'm going to tell you it's going to get even crazier. That's why it's so important for us for us to have the love of God on the inside of us. Verse 22, have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Let's talk about that very briefly here. We are to build ourselves up. That word means to build upon, to be active. Let me tell you, the glory of, of the Lord and the things that the Lord told you five years ago, are you still standing on those things and that's all that you're grasping on? Is the Lord doing something new and fresh in your life right now? Why in this, in this day and age, in the circumstances that we are in, in the, in, in the society that we are living in, God should be speaking very loudly to his people and saying, hey, shine the light for me out there. So what is God calling you to? Build yourself up. Build upon what God has done in your life. Be active on that. The word that we read, keep, means to maintain, to keep in a state of maintain what you have maintain keep going don't just let it just kind of peter out and that's it maintain 
And then praying in the Holy Spirit. There's that, that prayer that we pray. And, you know, Romans tells us that praying in the Spirit, and that Spirit prays for us and, and moanings and groanings so deep that we can't even understand. And there is prayer that is just, we close our eyes in prayer, and then there is prayer where you are getting down deep, and you are grinding it out for the Lord. You know, like God, I whatever whatever you you have for me here, God, I'm 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 desperate and I'm moving forward. And there's people in my life that need to hear, and and I'm praying for it. I'm standing in the gap. And then I love that looking forward to that second coming, man. Like I said, I'm ready to fly. But while we're building, while we're maintaining, while we're praying and looking forward to that second coming, we are to consider. And play a part in the salvation of others. Listen, Jude talks about having mercy on some who doubt. There are people out there who are ready to come to the Lord, but they're still doubting. It's like, ah, I don't know. I, I, I can't commit. Let me, let me tell you something. It's got to be a 100% commitment. If you're watching this and you're like 50% committed to the Lord, there's something wrong. God wants all of you. He wants the whole commitment. He wants everything. He wants your whole heart. So there are some people out there that are still doubting. So let's have mercy on them. Let's have a little bit of kindness for them. Like, I know that you, you're struggling and I'm going to be praying for you. And I'm going to be there for you. And I will, uh, I will, you know, answer your, your questions. I will give you scripture verses. I will check up on you, right? There are people who are looking for answers and looking for faith. They just haven't fully committed. And that is something that only they can do. You can't force them to. And Jude says that there's others that need to be snatched out of the fire. That they need to be dealt with directly. It's like, hey, you are not living for the Lord. And you need to come out. And you need to be a little bit more vigorous with them. A little bit more assertive. And like, hey, you know, there's some people that you have uh, dropped hints to, right? We do that. We drop hints. Hey, you know, maybe you should come to church. Or, hey, maybe, you know, have you ever thought about praying? Uh, hey, can I get you a Bible? And then there's some times where we need to be like, hey, why haven't you given your life to the Lord? What is keeping you from giving your life 100% to the Lord? There's some that need to be asked that question very directly. And people in our lives. And then there's mercy with fear. There's kindness with the fear of the Lord because, listen, there are some people that are in sin and we need to have mercy on them. But we need to be careful because sin is very enticing. And if we find ourselves so close to that, that we are enticed to that sin, then that is wrong and we need to be careful. And we don't want to be drawn away from the faith or drawn into sin. Jude talks about hating even the garment of flesh, hating sin. Don't hate the sinner, but we hate sin. And we need to make sure that we are able to keep our distance away from it so that we are not enticed into that. Guys, let me close out here. This, let me summarize this for you as we, as we get ready to close out. God's love is a covenant love. It is based on him. It is based on his word and his agreement. And there's nothing that we can do to cancel it out. Only if we choose to walk away. But he will never, ever cancel it out. There's nothing you can do to change it. God's love is accessible through Jesus Christ. That is the way that it is. There is only one way to the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ. No other religion, no other way, no other answer. It is only Jesus. God's love is accessible through Jesus. And the love of God is poured out on us. The love of God is poured out on us so great, so large through the Holy Spirit. And it's not just a little trickle. It's not just a little sprinkle. It is poured out greatly. And nothing that can ever happen in this world, nothing that can ever happen in this life can separate you from the love of God. Those that are His, those that truly love, 
Those who truly love God will keep his commandments. And we are called, believers are called to keep themselves in the love of God. See, there's a lot of people that will say, well, I walk down the aisle. I'm, no, no, there is a process of sanctification. There is, a, there is the process of keeping yourself, building yourself, staying in the, in the word of God, staying in prayer, staying in the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit. That is important. See, God showed how much that he loved us by giving us his son. He didn't give us a formula. He didn't give us a template. He didn't give us an idea. He didn't give us a form of government. He didn't give us an ideology. He didn't send an angel or a prophet or another book of the Bible. He sent his only son. Everything else stems from that. His love is tied to his son, nothing else. And that is the most important thing that Christians should be talking about. The most important things that Christians should be living out. And if we are not, we are missing it. And we are not being the people that God calls us to be. Have you experienced the love of God? Because you have given your life and accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Some of you watching might not be sure of that. Some of you that are watching this right now, you're like, I don't know if I have, if I have experienced the tr truly experienced the love of God because I don't know if I really have given my life to the Lord. I might have said some words. I might have said, uh, you know, I might have got a Bible. I, I, I might have, you know, done some stuff. I might have felt emotional at one point, but I truly never gave my life to the Lord. You know, Romans 9.10 says this. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Understand that your sin separates you from Christ and from the love of God. You repent of your sin and that means that you simply do a turnaround and you don't embrace the life of sin anymore. You choose not to sin. And then you accept Jesus. And here, listen, you start living according to his ways. You don't say a little prayer and then leave and then go continue back into the way that things were. There is a change. You are a new creation. A new life is there for you. And so you live according to his ways and in the newness of life that he has for you. If that's you today, and you need to make Jesus number one in your life. I hope you do it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your love that is immeasurable. And how desperate we are, Lord, to accept you and to walk in your ways more and more. Father, I pray that we are not comfortable with the place that we are in with you, that we move closer to you, that we draw closer to you. I thank you for that. Father, right now, I pray for those that are listening to this and that they are unsure of their relationship with you. Father, I pray that they would believe in their hearts and confess with their mouth that you are Lord, Lord, and as you, they, as they do that, that you would come and fill them up through the power of the Holy Spirit with the love of God that is so overwhelming. They've left the life of sin behind and have taken on the new creation. They've become a new creation in you. I thank you for that, Lord. And it's as simple as that. Thank you and give you praise and glory. Father, I pray for wisdom in this day and age, not only for our leaders, Lord, all the way from our community, all the way up, but I pray, Lord, for wisdom for us, that we would navigate this world according to your ways, that we wouldn't let the influence of the world, influence of all the things, all the voices that are out there, 
that your voice would be the loudest that we hear, that your spirit would be the loudest that we hear and obey. I pray that you would be with every single person here, Lord, that maybe because of the current economic situation, Lord God, that financially they're struggling. I pray for finances, Lord. I pray for blessings. Father, I pray for healing for those that are sick and need a healing touch. Again, Lord, we don't need to, to lay hands. Your power, like the Roman soldier, knows no bounds. There's no limits. Touch those that need a healing touch right now, right where they're at. Father, I just thank you so much that you would help us to be the people that you have called us to be and to love greatly because we have the love of God on the inside of us. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, guys, thank you so much for being here and worshiping with us online. Listen, what are you going to do with what you heard today? The great, the great sadness of what happens on Sunday mornings is people go to church, they hear the message, they leave, and they just file it away somewhere. What are you going to do in response to what God has told you and shared with you and the Holy Spirit has ministered to you today? What is God calling you to? How is God wanting you to respond? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go with God.